a reckoning with our weather, our climate, our future. On the Canary Island of La Palma, a forest fire rages out of control as authorities rush through the flames to evacuate around 4,000 people. I have seen many wildfires, but none like this one. This is terrible. Horrible. At night, the roads are even more terrifying. The mayor says they've seen below average rainfall and now they're facing Europe's blazing heat wave, a combination causing an apocalyptic backdrop mirrored across the continent. Temperatures today in Greece, Italy and Spain peaked at well over 30 degrees Celsius and in Cyprus in excess of 40 degrees. The Acropolis in Athens was temporarily shut over the weekend to protect tourists from the baking sun, while Italian authorities issued an extreme health risk warning for 15 cities, including Rome and Florence, due to the sweltering heat. The data speaks for itself. Temperatures on the European continent show long-term warming trends for annual averages, especially since the 1990s. And the closer we get to the present, the hotter it's been. Europe's 10 warmest years on record have all taken place since the year 2000, with the five hottest years coming since 2014. <coughs> Europeans aren't alone. Americans are dealing with a heat wave stretching from the tip of Florida to the west coast. Nearly a third of the US population, around 110 million people, remain under heat advisories and warnings. My store is currently underwater. Underwater. Our changing climate causes extremes at both ends, with Mississippi experiencing torrential rain and subsequent flooding. The warmer the temperature, the greater the water absorbed by the atmosphere, then the heavier the downpour. Short, sharp and devastating. Just look at South Korea, also the scene of heavy rain, flash floods and landslides, causing the deaths of at least 37 people. Workers have pulled nine bodies from this flooded tunnel after vehicles became trapped underneath. They're still searching for the missing, with the forecast of 12 more inches of rain until Tuesday. As authorities across the world right now resort to rescue, the other issue is long-term mitigation. The US Special Envoy on Climate Change, John Kerry, arrived in Beijing today to meet his Chinese counterpart. The world's biggest fossil fuel polluters engaging in climate dialogue for the first time in a year. While China shows progress in some areas, such as its use of solar power and electric vehicles, its consumption of coal still rises. And even though Joe Biden's administration touts its green agenda, they still have to deal with a skeptical opposition back home. Why do you think 195 countries in the world, their prime ministers, their presidents... Because they're grifting they're, like you are, sir. <laughs> this, uh, that's a pretty shocking statement, that you believe that all the scientists in the world are grifters, honestly. Not all scientists agree with you, Mr. Sutter. 98% of all the scientists in the world... Science isn't yeah. about agreement. It's not about consensus. You know that. That view can be hard to fathom given scenes like these, as more and more people in more and more countries experience extreme weather. And remember, officials are warning that next week it'll get even warmer in Europe, potentially the hottest temperatures ever recorded on the continent. Well, joining me now is Professor Emily Shukpura, a climate scientist and director of Cambridge Zero, Cambridge University's research unit, which uh, aims to offer responses to the climate crisis. So, so uh, Emily, just let's deal with what's happening now, because you've got El Nino going on, haven't you, which sort of raises sea surface temperatures. That's not all that can explain these extreme temperatures in Europe, though, is it? Uh, no, I mean, El Nino is important uh, globally, but it's a natural cycle that creates warmer and cooler temperatures in um, every few years. But what we're seeing is really the effects of climate change playing out, particularly uh, we've seen these extreme temperatures in, in Europe. Um, and as you say, predictions of those getting even more extreme over the coming days. And really, it's from pole to pole that we're seeing the uh, the effects of climate change now. If you look in Greenland in the in the north, we're seeing extreme melting in Greenland all the way down to Antarctica where there are record low levels of sea ice. Climate change is happening, it's here and now. 
Yeah, and it's extreme flooding in Asia, extreme heat also in the US, as, as, well, as, as well as Europe, uh, and quite apocalyptic scenes that we're almost sort of growing accustomed to. I mean, do, do you see this any, any way out for us? Well, on the one hand, you know, I'm a climate scientist and I've been with my colleagues warning of exactly these sorts of threats of climate change for 30 years now. And in many ways, it's, it's literally heartbreaking from a climate scientist perspective to see the impacts now happening and people's lives being affected by it. Um, what can we do? Well, we know what to do. We know that the only way of preventing this getting worse and worse and are steadily moving into an apocalyptic future is to reduce emissions. And the, the good news is that we know how to do that. We have the technologies. Universities like mine in Cambridge, um, we're developing new battery technologies to drive forward cleaner energy futures. And we're working with um, the farming community, looking at how we can um, farm our land differently so that um, we're reducing the emissions from, from, from our farming. Uh, across the board, we have the solutions. And what we need to do now is to implement them, to put in place the policies um, that support the scale up of those solutions globally, and also to put in place the finance. One of the big um, stories of the moment on the on, in terms of climate change is uh, the lack of um, response in terms of developed countries um, providing the finance into yeah. developing countries to both support them in terms of protecting them against the climate change and also helping them to move towards a cleaner future themselves. But there seems to be a sort of stuck record syndrome, doesn't it, with this discussion? It seems to go round and round in circles. And just this week, we've got China and the US, the world's two biggest polluters, again, having sort of tentative climate talks. When are they actually going to get together and show some joint leadership, do you think? Uh, <laughs> stock record is exactly right. It does feel like a stock record. I, you know, I, I feel that I say the same thing day in, day out, week in, week out, year in, year out. And uh, all that's happening is the world is steadily getting in a worse and worse situation. It is so frustrating and we should all be really frustrated about it. Um, because as I say, the solutions are there. We know what needs to be done. But with, with and China and the US happening briefly, at the pace um, that's necessary. Sorry to cut in, but with China and the US briefly, in, in particular, China building new coal fired power stations, you know, are they going to show that leadership briefly? Who knows, right? I, I mean, there are aspects in which China is progressing in terms of uh, some of those technologies, the photovoltaics, the, the, the solar panels, um, the, uh, the uh, uh, electric vehicles. China is leading the way. So in some of the solutions, yes. Um, you've heard um, uh, some of the political situation in, in the United States where, incredibly, there are still um, groups who are denying the very fact of climate change. Um, so, you know, we're in the face of all of that. What can we either or as individuals okay. or, or as the UK do, we can show leadership. Um, okay. We can try and see how we can. And we need to because it's a global problem. It and is. Professor it Emily Shukran. It requires Shukra. a global solution. Thank you so much. We have to leave it there. Thank you very much.